Thank you. And thanks for the organization to have me here speak, and especially with the two prior speakers, because I cannot believe how good a setup I got. First of all, I got a job security in the Valley, because my background in SEO, thank you for giving me that uh, uh, props. And I, I have actually some data that shows how important building relationships in PR are that Asha uh, introduced. So first of all, my name is Dennis Goedegebure, but I, call, uh, I listen to Dennis G. I'm originally Dutch. Last year was my decade of uh, anniversary uh, in SEO. I spent around nine and a half years at eBay, uh, started in the Netherlands, uh, then one year at Geeknet, then I was at Airbnb, so I don't have to uh, m uh, fix all the search engine result pages anymore from the Mashable that you just saw. And now I'm at Fanatics, which is, I get the question, what is Fanatics? Well, we are the largest um, sports merchandise e-tailer uh, in the US, and we power NFL, shop.com, NBA.com, et cetera. So my approach to SEO is a little different than you might hear in the, in the industry. I see SEO as an outcome of a very well-designed product and epic content. And designed, I mean not only how it looks, but also how it works. UX is very important. You've heard a couple of times today, hey, you can market a, a, a product that sucks, but you won't only get so far. It needs to be a working product. And epic content is something that I've been experimenting with over the last five years or so, and it's getting better and better, the results that I'm getting. And I, uh, I like to use acronyms. Epic stands for engaging, something that people want to share. Profitable, it needs to add to the bottom and top line growth of your business. Informational, like the data-driven stories that you just heard that journalists just eat up, something that, is, uh, some, uh, that you can provide that nobody else has. Have. It needs to be cultural relevant. Cultural relevant uh, uh, moments in time do very well when, when people are experiencing something uh, online. So this is what I did around five years ago already at eBay. Uh, this is the launch of the first iPad for Apple. You might remember it was announced in January. It went live somewhere in, in, in May for sale only in the US. Six months later, the rest of the world were getting it. And what happens when something uh, is launched in the US only and everybody wants to have it, it's end, ends up, oh, it ends up on eBay and it's being sold all over the world. Well, because Apple didn't release any sales data or any data at all of, of how the iPad was doing, there was an opportunity for eBay here, especially because we had the, uh, um, the data that showed what people were prepared to, uh, to buy an iPad for to get it six months earlier in a country. And people in United, uh, uh, United Arab Emirates were actually uh, paying $700 over the retail price of an iPad to get it six months earlier. Obviously, they have much more cash there because of the oil. Um, but this data, I just grabbed it. Went on Elance and got a designer in Argentina designed this simple infographic for $250 and didn't run it through PR. I was going to ask for forgiveness instead of permission. And I happened to know two guys who started a small tech block in the Netherlands called The Next Web. And I did a guest post on it. So this is where relationships come in. Because I invited these guys who were actually pitching one of their startups to uh, Michael Arrington in 2006 to barbecue at my house. And we became friends. And I was. Uh, able to post this on the next web. And what happened next, of course, because everybody's looking at all the articles that are being circulated, it ends on, up on TechCrunch, Gizmodo do, does a, an article about it, and it, the New York Times does it as well. So what do you do if you have a very uh, successful campaign and Apple launches an iPad 2? Right, you do it again. Right? A year later, same kind of strategy, and just look at all the number of articles that we got. 
Well, this is very easy if you're a big brand, right? Like your eBay, you have all this data, you have some distribution. So fast forward a little bit. Um, I recommend you go back on the next web and search for this article about Ryan Holiday doing a speech on the next web conference, how to manipulate the media. And I'm not going to, going to endorse everything that he's done because it's a little bit sketchy, but he wrote a book about it because he was doing a study. But it does show you how some of the media nowadays work. There's a lot of uh, um, uh, public, uh, publications that copy each other's news. So if you do get an article and exposure, there's a very high chance of being replicated about, uh, over, the, uh, over the rest of the tech industry. But if you don't get coverage, how do you get in front of the right writer? How do you get an article that can be published? And how do you get the news that all your startup or your campaign deserves? Well, there's a, an, a couple of things that I, I learned from these kind of uh, uh, campaigns and this video is about how do you get large um, a number of people talking about your campaign or your product? Well, if it's epic, some uh, people want to share it. People want to spend five minutes of their life on that campaign. They will share it. Um, this is based on research that a company did, a uh, company called Fractal. They have very good relationships with uh, um, a large number of digital publishers, and they interviewed 500 of them. And it shows you that pitching something to a digital publisher does not really work. Because everybody writing for TechCrunch, The Verge, or uh, uh, Recode, they get around 250 to 500 pitches, and they only have five stories to write a week. So what is the chance that your uh, pitch is getting picked up? And then if you read the first bullet point, the writers of the New York Times, Guardian, or CNN never base a story on a pitch. It's about building that personal relationship first and then see if you can integrate their ideas into the campaign and make them part of that campaign. Well, it's very funny that um, uh, I bring it up this research because I just got this forwarded after I did a very large campaign when I was working at Airbnb, and the person who interviewed me for Inc. Magazine actually works for Fractal, and she said, well, you did a lot of that, what we see in this research right in that campaign, and we didn't even know it. So let me run through that. Anybody has seen this campaign that we did last year based on a true story called Wall and Chain? It was very cultural relevant because last year was the 25th year anniversary of the Berlin Wall coming down. And we had a former West Berlin Wall Guard and an East Berlin Wall Guard uh, meeting each other up in Airbnb uh, years ago. And we brought it to life in an animated film, 75 seconds. Um, you can still see it, we just won a Webby, yay. Um, uh, on belonganywhere.com, you can uh, look at the movie. I'm not gonna show it to you now. Um, but we got massive, massive earned media through it. We were featured in around 120 uh, high priority uh, uh, media publications uh, with 99% positive sentiment in the messaging. Uh, through our social media um, coverage, we got a lot of people to share it. We owned 2.2% of the conversation around the 25th year anniversary of the wall coming down. And the link was the ninth sh most shared link in that conversation universe. And our Twitter handle was the 10th most shared Twitter handle. While we're not something, uh, we're like a hospitality company that created a really nice story. So how did we do this? So first of all, the campaign consisted of four key elements. The animated film, a landing page, a launch event on the night before the actual anniversary, 
where we uh, got guests and hosts together who were uh, from Berlin and traveling to Berlin. And we had a massive me online media campaign that I will give you some insight in. First of all, the launch event. We created a space, and my partner in crime uh, on, on this campaign, Willa, was the creative producer. She's in the, air, in, the, in the audience, so big props to her. We created a space that was actually uh, separated by a carton box wall where you had the west side and the east side. And you could communicate with the two sides through Instagram photo booth with uh, the hashtag embedded into the, the uh, conversation. And people were tweeting about it. So we were getting that message in, of the campaign already out through the 680 guests that we had in, on this event. Uh, through that, a lot of media picked it up uh, for, um, with the hashtag. We actually in, uh, invited eight um, journalists from around Europe uh, to come to Berlin, stay in an Airbnb, and come to the launch event to uh, talk to a guest and host and uh, experience the whole immersive experience that we have, have created on the event. We, we went through our normal PR team who, had, who are in the house as well, just like with Porch, who have those relationships, and we were able to leverage them uh, for that as well. And then our online campaign, and we worked, I think, with the best um, social media, psychographic and affinity targeting company in the world uh, called AimClear. Marty is a good friend of mine. And we created 80 different psychographic and affinity audiences we, which we were targeting with very targeted messages. A, to get distribution of the campaign. B, to get the campaign in front of the right people that might write about it. And to show you that it doesn't have to cost a fortune to do this, here are 1.4 million people in Europe who actually are interested in the Berlin Wall or the Berlin Wall anniversary and have uh, or are frequent travelers. So it's very targeted audience already. Still 1.4 million. But what about, um, let me see, 6,500 people who work in animation or in design or like Smashing Magazine or writing for that who are actually associated professor of graphic design to showcase the animated film to them and get more distribution through that. And oh, by the way, they're all frequent travelers as well. Or here, we have 30,000 people who work at ad agencies. These are your peers. So you want your peers to be talking about your campaign to their clients, to their other peers at a happy hour, or if they're judging at an award um, as, um, ceremony. Then you can get that extra media coverage if you happen to win an award. Here are 5,000 people who work for Fortune magazine, Harvard Business Review, The Wall Street Journal, um, Economist, et cetera, et cetera, and have a job title of editor, uh, chief editor, senior editor, writer, et cetera. Don't you want to target those 5,000 people with a very targeted message, and they pick your campaign up by spending $500 to target them on LinkedIn? all possible. Or here's my favorite. 1,420 people who work at Upworthy, BuzzFeed, Dig, Reddit, StumbleUpon, Soul Pancake, Five Second, Second Film, Mashable, and Gawker Media. Did the audience that you would like to target with the campaign to get coverage. So please think about how you can take advantage of these highly targeted audiences for your PR efforts. And if you're really, really smart, and you all are because you're here, you're setting up a DMP to cookie those users and retarget them later on if you do your follow-up campaign so you can actually know, hey, this people, these people already interacted with my prior content. They might be willing to write even uh, about me with the next one. And you set up a separate campaign, and you can just follow them on their lifestyle. So, that's where you still do a kind of like a shotgun approach, but you're not building up those relationships yet. 
So I have here a couple of tools that are grabbed together um, that can help you build relationships more at scale, being smart. Because we not only all have a bag with cash getting from a VC. So if you want to build relationships with, with digital producer online, you first want to know what are, you, what are you trying to cover? Who's most influential in that space? What are those people reading? What, who are they interacting with? And then be there, be part of the conversation to start building that relationship. So you might want to, you might be able to do that by one, two, or three people, but can you really scale to 20, 30, 50, 100? Well, we can do that. Listen up. First of all, we go to Bus Sumo. Yesterday, because I work in sports now, NFL draft was a madhouse. It was really exciting to see. Uh, we had seven players on the contract to tweet for us, which was great. Uh, so NFL draft, you go type it in in Bus Sumo. This is 20, last 24 hours, and you filter it on your favorite platform that you would like to be have coverage on. Here it's Twitter, and you see that two articles from uh, Bleacher Report are at the top. So you fill, you you're going to uh, look further into Bleacher Report and you see that the best articles from Bleacher Report on the last 24 hours, like uh, Kyle Newport has two of them of the last four. So we're going to zoom in on Kyle Newport as an uh, editor we might want to uh, engage with. And here are some of the topics that Kyle's writing about, the most shared ones, and then you can see if these still match your topic that you, you would like to uh, get coverage on. Now, his Twitter uh, handle is probably freely available. So then we use a, 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 a tool called Tags, which is more like a Google Doc. And you can download the, uh, uh, the Google Doc over here, make a copy, and use it yourself. Um, you you uh, validate your uh, Twitter API credentials. You put in advanced Twitter search, uh, searches, and it starts building an archive. So it's here, it's filter equals link from Kara Swisher, Alexia Panzer, Casey Newton, Reckless, and Boris. Uh, two TechCrunch writers, two Diverge writers, and the founder of the next web. It builds an archive on who gets the most, who, who tweets the most tweets with a link in it, who gets the most responses and the most retweets on it to get a sense of how well they're distributed. And this is all automated. It automatically updates every hour. So you don't have to do that search every hour. No, it, it does it for you. If, you can, if you're really advanced in Excel, you can make the doc available publicly, import it through an uh, uh, Excel query online, and do something what Richard Baxter from Build Visible has done to build like an automatic um, Excel tool that teases out the, the uh, domains that are most shared. You can look up his MossCon speech online if you're interested in it. But we just want to mine the people that we have. So at the bottom of the, uh, um, of the sheet, there's this uh, small link which shows you the, uh, the people that have tweeted the most and all their connections. You, so you can start building that whole network. Or the people that are most conversational. And then you can uh, quickly see all the conversations that they're having. And you can start building relationships with them by uh, responding to them and have uh, insert yourself in the conversation. And at the time that you're going to send them an email, but you don't have an email address, well, here's a very nifty tool that if they have a Gravatar, uh, which is like the WordPress uh, commenting um, uh, account, if they have a Gravatar account, all you have need to do is use this Google Doc or Excel file it is, and you put a first name, last name, and a domain in it, and it searches for all the different combinations of their name, and then if you see a picture there, it means that's their Gravatar account, so that's their email address, and you can do an outreach on it. It's a little hacky way. But, uh, so I got a couple of resources where I uh, had a lot of help from 
to form my uh, models. Epic Content Marketing from Joe Paluzzi. Absolute amazing book if you want to do more in this space. Newsjacking from David Merman Scott. Uh, how to insert yourself in a, in a very um, not brand, uh, not spammy way into uh, relevant cultural conversations. I can highly recommend to watch this 17 minute video from Coca-Cola con uh, Content 2020. It's their strategy, how they produced content in a way that gets them disproportionate amount of uh, pop culture. And then influence uh, about persuasion and then the book from uh, 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 Holiday, Ryan Holiday about how to manipulate the media. And I'm done. Thank you.